Hello, I'm Laura Natale, Sales Tech Media Telecom Mobility Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the launch and presentation of the Center on Regulation in Europe, or SAIR's new report, Exploring Liability Rules for the Age of Artificial Intelligence. SAIR Research Fellow Miriam Bauten is the lead author of the report, which she will present shortly. And we also have SAIR Research Fellow Martin Peitz and SAIR Academic Co-Director Alexandre Boustrel, who co-authored. They're on the line today and might jump in as needed. This is a particularly thorough report resulting from months of intense work in a speedily evolving policy and academic environment. Of course, at the beginning of the current commission's mandate, there was an intention announced to legislate within 100 days on AI. A white paper followed in February 2020, and we now await imminent commission announcements. SER, being the independent Brussels-based think tank focused on top quality regulation practices, means we've drawn input for our work from across our multidisciplinary community, which spans academia, regulatory authorities, industry, and in this case, we also consulted consumer groups. So during the panel component of today's discussion, we'll be hearing from the European Commission, Google, Vodafone and Bayouk, uh, and a key view from the European Parliament will be streamed too. For the panel, we would like your questions via Slido, uh, and the hashtag we're using today is hashtag AISER, or you can scan the QR code that appears on screen. I will put questions to the speakers uh, throughout the session, but also today we want to learn your views. So I would like to open the Slido poll. Hopefully, from right about now, you can find uh, two questions on Slido with some answer option, and we are looking forward to your views on these. So the first question is, should AI liability rules be stricter for AI systems than for non-AI systems? The options you can answer there are yes, no, or no opinion. Also, uh, the second question is, do we need EU harmonized rules to protect against AI harms? And there you can either answer that EU harmonization is needed or that it's best left to the member states or no opinion. We warmly welcome you to sign up to the free SAR newsletter. You'll find details in the box below if you're following on YouTube or on the SAR website, SAR.eu. Uh, on the website from right about now, you should be able to find the report we're discussing today as well. So, Miriam, um, as mentioned, this has been an immense effort and uh, what a pleasure to finally be able to share this work with everyone. Uh, as we were putting together this study and gathering all the input, I think it's worth highlighting the sheer volume of literature out there that you, that you had to, to look through. It was updating on the weekly at points and I think we also found that much of the volume we were looking at remained rather, rather cursory, if I may, in terms of analysis. And what we really sought to achieve with this report is to drill down into what the liability issues really are by asking some of the trickier questions, identifying gaps in liability regimes, and if you like, I think you, Martin, and Alexandre have sought to cross over the bridge into the implications piece as well. Um, and you ask about risks and look in a more exacting way at what needs to be done. So for this inaugural presentation of your findings, uh, you have some visual aids too in the form of slides. So I'll hand over to you now uh, for your presentation. Thanks so much, Miriam, and many congratulations again on the Thank you, Lara, and thank you for everyone joining today. I'm very happy to be presenting this report on EU liability rules on artificial intelligence today. As you said, um, it was a few months of work and uh, many uh, out there are writing on this topic. So uh, new things to read uh, all the time. Uh, so together with Martin Peitz and Alexandre Destrel, uh, we wrote this report. Before I dive into some of the key recommendations, I would like to um, give a bit of background as to why this question of liability rules for artificial intelligence deserves our uh, attention. And um, this has to do, of course, with the opportunities and risks of AI for society. Now, the European Commission and the European Parliament in their resp reports on artificial intelligence already highlighted some of the characteristics of AI that 
um, make uh, or that pose challenges for liability. We've been building on these characteristics. And here I would highlight uh, two key aspects that we believe are relevant for liability rules. Now, first, advanced AI systems that have learning capabilities. So we're particularly thinking of machine learning technologies and other advanced learning technologies. They take a fundamentally different approach to problem solving than humans. And that allows them to take better decisions than we do. Uh, it is one of the key benefits that they uh, provide um, because they these technologies find patterns or solutions that humans would not have come up with. At the same time, this uh, trait can make them less predictable to humans. So if they make a mistake, um, then that may not be so predictable to us. If we think of an autonomous car, um, they might be uh, much safer than human drivers. But if they make a mistake, this might be a mistake that a human driver would not have made. And so the set of errors that occurs is different, and we may not be able to predict very well where they will happen. At the same time, as these technologies become more autonomous and at some point start supporting and also replacing human decision making, the question arises, when are we as humans still responsible for what these technologies do? The key benefit, of course, is that uh, technologies can free up our time, they can free up our resources, and they can, once again, improve our decision making but it also shifts control. So if a physician, uh, for instance, relies on a diagnostics AI tool, uh, the question is, if that tool makes a mistake, then under what circumstances would that doctor need to intervene and override the decision of the artificial intelligence system? So less predictability and more autonomy may pose risk, uh, risks that pose challenges for liability. Now in this report, we posed two questions. So first we asked, what are possible gaps in our current liability rules? And second, if we change these rules, what would be uh, the impact for producers, operators, and for the development of AI? So first we have a look at the existing legal framework relevant to AI. We have a look also at, uh, at safety rules. Then we consider the challenges for liability rules that AI raises. Next, we ask what would liability rules actually need to achieve. So we do this from an economic perspective. So we say in what, uh, so how can we design liability rules so that they actually minimize harm associated with accidents that uh, happen in the context of artificial intelligence? Um, and how can, we, um, how can we make sure that every party involved takes care to avoid such harm? And then based on that, we draft um, recommendations for the liability of producers and the liability of operators. So we look at both parties because clearly uh, both have a role to play. And finally, we look at the scope of a possible European regime for liability. So first we need to acknowledge that liability rules are only part of the bigger picture. First, there are ex ante uh, safety rules and regulations. Um, we might have ethical guidelines and part of that puzzle are liability rules. The rules that we have may be horizontal uh, safety rules for all types of products. Some of them may be sector specific because we consider particular sectors or contexts to be particularly risky. And then we may have rules both on the EU and the national level. So for liability rules, the European uh, impact so far has been on producer liability, whereas other liability rules so far have been governed by the member states. Now within that broader context, we then look at these challenges for liability rules. So focusing again on these aspects of less predictability and a shift in control. If we now consider someone who's been harmed, an AI system was involved and they wish to get compensation for their harm. Now, what problems would they run into? First, they may want to approach the producer uh, arguing that the product was defective. Uh, here, the injured party may have uh, difficulties because the question arises, when is an autonomous system defective? So if we really think of, for example, a car or a, a consumer product that is supposed to act autonomously, some people have said, well, we should simply take any case of harm as a defect because that product is supposed to function well. That might be quite far reaching because that would shift all the, the responsibility to the producer. And so then the question arises: how um, safe does that product need to be? 
or when can we call a defector? What failure rate is acceptable for these products? So an injured party may have difficulty in court, may also have difficulty proving this defect um, in the context of complex algorithms. If they then want to approach uh, the operator, and so by that we mean the owner or the user of the system, the, um, the injured party may find it difficult to establish that that party was at fault. Um, as soon as you delegate a decision to an AI system, assuming that it has some level of autonomy, the question is what type of supervising duties uh, would the owner or the operator have? So when is the operator at fault for employing an AI system that then harms somebody? In some cases, it might be clear, maybe the producer uh, got gives information not to use a product in certain circumstances. In others, it may not be so clear. And in all of these cases, uh, the injured party would need to prove that the um, problem with the AI system or the fault of the operator actually led to the harm. And so also in the context of causality, um, the injured party may have difficulties and proving um, the defect, the fault, and the causality is sort of a common factor here. Now, knowing that we see these challenges for liability rules, now, what do we want to achieve with liability rules? So what is our basis for possible recommendations here? I'd like to highlight three things. First, it is useful to follow a risk-based approach as the European Commission and the European Parliament have been proposing. Um, so if the risk is higher, we may want uh, more intensive um, prevention mechanisms. These rules may need to be technology neutral. That's actually a topic of debate. So do we say, well, it doesn't matter if you use an AI technology or any other product, your responsibility should be the same, or do we find that um, AI needs to be safer or responsibilities need to be stricter? What we do know for sure is that we need to incentivize all parties involved to take due care. Um, this might be difficult or tricky when uh, efforts are complementary. So if we think of a supply chain with multiple stakeholders, multiple producers involved, um, and it's essential both that the party producing the algorithm, but also the party supplying data, uh, take care in making sure that that all works well in order to uh, prevent harm, uh, we need to make sure that liability just doesn't dilute these incentives by either dividing liability over them in a way um, or or making only one party liable in a way that does not incentivize all parties involved. Harm might also be, um, the risk of harm might also be correlated. So if we think of the example with the Boeing Max, for example, um, if there's an error in the, in the programming or if there's an error in an algorithm that might affect a whole fleet of products, whereas an error in a production of a mechanical product may actually also affect one individual product. So if we think of correlated risks of harm, uh, we need um, proper um, instruments to deal with that. Overall, there are multiple trade-offs because on the one hand, we want to incentivize all parties to, to prevent uh, harm from AI, but we also want to incentivize innovation. We want to make sure that beneficial AI is in fact adopted and deployed. Arguably, we don't want to wait until AI is perfect and in the meantime be left with lots of accidents and harm from non-AI products uh, that AI could actually be replacing. So this is the balancing act we are dealing with. Now, what does this then mean um, when we think of the possibilities for new rules? So here we look both at the standard uh, of a possible EU regime and the scope. In terms of the standard, um, we're discussing possibly going beyond a fold-based standard uh, suggestions have mostly been strict liability or a presumption of, for instance, a defect or a presumption of causality. Um, a possible intermediate solution would be to say, well, we'll alter the standard of proof in order to um, help injured parties. I'll get back to that in a bit. When it comes to the scope, so far, as I said, member states uh, are, in, are in charge. Of, the EU uh, has laid down liability rules for producers. The question is now, is it useful to have EU liability rules, for instance, for all high-risk AI, and then how would we define that? Um, or do we, for instance, start with focusing on sector-specific regulation and see where we can add liability rules there, knowing that these types of products uh, cause specific risks? So in the remaining time, let me just have a look at each of these categories. So first, producer liability. 
here we recommend specifically in the context of the uh, a possible review of the of the product liability directive first um, we consider that software may need to be included in the in the concept of products uh, because the risks may need to be the same and the requirement for a product to be tangible may no longer be justified in a world where we download uh, a lot of products second consumers may have ex safety expectations that go beyond the moment that they in fact buy the product so not only in the context of ai if we, if we think of connected products iot products um, the safety of the product may depend on updates um, and um, consumers may need to be able to rely um, yeah, on that for a longer time. So that might need to be reflected in producer liability as well. When it comes to the defect, it is useful to think of an overall failure rate rather than a failure in one individual product for the reasons that I mentioned before. And finally, when we think of the standard of proof, um, a presumption is one option. A presumption of a defect and of causality would be quite far reaching an alternative would be to lower the standard of proof. So this is something that member state courts have been doing, for instance, in the context of medication, of pharmaceuticals, where they've found ways in procedural laws to facilitate injured parties to get compensation for their harm. So that may be something to think of in this context as well. And we recognize, of course, that producer liability goes beyond the scope of AI. Um, here we merely give some recommendations that would be relevant in this uh, context. Now, finally, when we look also at the operator, um, we see a need for liability there as well. It's even if a system may become more autonomous, it is useful that the operator has incentives to monitor this device, to make sure that it's employed only then when it is safe uh, and to maintain it. Also, the operator is the one benefiting from using uh, the device. So that's another reason to hold them liable too. The question is then still, when should they be liable under what conditions? Um, here we consider a big group of AI products and systems that probably would not be high risk. Then there is a group of possibly high risk AI um, that, is, that operates in public space and can cause injury and, and, and property harm. And within this category, we ask, well, what is what is the group of products that is already covered by sector specific regulation? What is the group of products that remains after that? So what is a useful scope for such, uh, for such an approach? Tricky may of course be to actually define high risk and define AI in this context in a way that is both clear enough so that national proceedings don't revolve endlessly around the question if a product belongs to this category, yes or no and at the same time flexible enough to deal with new products coming on the market. And one advantage we see of following sector specific regulation is that the context in which a particular technology or application is used may be just as relevant for the risk as that technology itself. Now, I think my time is up, so I will leave it at that for now and leave the rest for our discussion. Uh, thank you very much and I look forward to hearing all of your views. Congratulations again, Miriam. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for this presentation. Very methodical uh, study, and of course, the recommendations uh, that 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 you uh, and your co-authors have come up with. Uh, people will have different views on these, and, and we very much look forward to debating them. Now, as mentioned, um, I interviewed MEP Axel Voss, who rapporteured for the Yuri Committee's AI resolution and is currently rapporteur for the Special Committee on AI in the Parliament, ADA. He couldn't join us today, unfortunately, but he has seen um, our report, so we'll now play that recording where he reacts. To, to the SAIR report just presented and where we also discuss the path forward for AI liability within the European Parliament. Axel Voss, thank you very much indeed for your time. In your role as rapporteur for the current 12-month mandate of the European Parliament's Special Committee on AI in the Digital Age, which we'll refer to as ADA, you'll be the penholder on the final findings uh, from the year's activities. 
And the committee's purpose, of course, will be to take a horizontal approach towards setting out a long-term EU roadmap that takes note of the impact and challenges of rolling out AI to identify EU-wide objectives and propose recommendations for the best ways forward. Um, at CER, we're holding this webinar on the occasion of the publication of our study on EU liability rules for the age of AI. And we're of course hoping it will be a central reference point for decision makers. On that basis, uh, Mr. Voss, it would be very helpful for us to understand how we need to reflect on the work we've done. And if you could provide us with your reactions to this new report, we'd be very grateful. So are there any main points or recommendations we've made within the report that you like or agree with or find particularly helpful? And are there any views we've expressed that you might diverge from or have some concerns with? Yeah, thanks a lot and, and uh, thanks also for the possibility and, and having me, I'm sorry that I can't personally attend uh, to your event. Um, so the report, what you have done is a very good one from my point of view. Um, so you are also starting and, and thinking about uh, the risk-based approach. And, and I would say this is um, the best thing what we can do. We can focus on the high risk AI systems and not regulating everything in, in detail. We need this horizontal framework, and this means uh, principle-based, uh, future-proofed, and, and then comes in the form of a regulation that we have in our common market, um, yeah, full, harmoni full harmonization tool in form of a regulation. And uh, for all AI, um, across the EU, EU is crucial also to in, in order to establish these equal standards. So I share very much um, the views of the report you have done also, and um, I would say there is no need also for complete revision of all uh, well-functioning liability um, regimes as the product liability um, directive itself or the national tort laws. And uh, so um, we, we have proven already this is an effective way to get compensated. But uh, however, due to the complexity, connectivity, opacity, vulnerability, and uh, autonomy of AI systems, um, yeah, so a new, a few specific liability provisions uh, are necessary to avoid a situation where which a person uh, who suffers harm um, might end up without a compensation. And this is the reason, one of the reasons, and the second reason, of course, what you're also mentioning is that this is not too much fragmented throughout the EU. And uh, therefore, I, I'm um, appreciating your report also on this. And it's very much, I would say, so far, what I have seen is uh, very much in line in what I have in mind. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, picking up on the point you've made there about legal clarity and certainty and avoiding fragmentation, with the member states, um, if you could perhaps indicate any further views you might have on what you believe the Commission should propose when it comes to AI liability in general. You, you've certainly pointed already to the fact that some of the existing regimes are, in your view, well functioning and we should stay specific. But do you have a view on, for example, the trade off between uh, providing more user protection? and the need to stimulate innovation in AI within Europe, noting, of course, the geopolitical race we have on AI leadership that stimulates a lot of debate here in Brussels. So um, if, if we are assuming that is um, kind of very difficult now for the user or the person who um, is harmed by an AI system or device or whatever, um, so that they can prove that this damage is caused by an AI system. We had to find a way that the 
um, user is get something on um, to to yeah to ask for compensation without having complicated situations to um, fulfill. So that's why um, we have the intention in concentrating on AI high risk systems and saying, and we are linking these to the, the strict liability, what is already in place in our member states, but this making this very clearer um, and throughout the whole EU. And um, therefore we are asking at the end what we ha also have already in place, like our insurance for, for cars, um, that we are asking for these high risk AI systems also that they have to be connected with an insurance. So, but this also means um, is not new to us. So we are already living in such a world where we are um, differentiating between these strong liability and let's say normal liability. And that's why we do think that we are just doing here something um, for more full harmonization throughout the EU. And um, of course, it's very difficult to have um, kind of a definition what means AI because it is so complex, but we need a definition here, uh, especially if, if we are coming to these uh, compensation questions. And um, also the definition of what is high risk and this is also very important to have this in place. So far, we are adding more than less two criteria to it that we are saying the high risk AI systems should be able to um, harm uh, damages for life, body and property. And, and secondly, um, that we have also in mind that this is a kind of a public threat in a way. So that you can't predict who might be the victim. So, and, and here, uh, these are criteria. Um, if you think this is not already um, perfectly done, then please give us input. But so far, uh, we have had these ideas, and um, I, I think this might be a good differentiation to, towards also other AI uh, systems. So, and this is what we having in mind, we do not need a, total re, a totally revision of liability regimes. We are just linking high risk systems to a strong liability and then the, um, yeah, let's say normal uh, AI systems to a normal liability. So, and, and please have also in mind there are liability regimes already in place, but it might differ throughout the member states. Um, and, and so, and this is what we think we need uh, to have one system throughout the EU. Thank you very much. So, um, understood on the, the broad themes of complementarity, harmonization, strong liability versus normal high liability and, and, and linking high risk with, with general risk. And, and on that basis, um, Mr. Voss, how do you see this issue moving forward in the European Parliament, both within uh, the committee for which your rapporteur and, and beyond? <laughs> um, so, of course, we have to be careful at first. So um, after this initiative report, of course, now uh, the Commission uh, has to create here um, a legislative proposal. This will probably come up in the third or fourth quarter of this year. And it seems that they will be connecting these question also with a revision of the product liability the directive. Um, this makes sense in a way because we have to find a regime what is um, coherent also in these liability questions. And uh, I hope we have signaled to the Commission that this is a kind of a 
approach where we are clarifying the legal situation, but also not over-regulating too much. I know a lot of industries are a little bit uh, concerned about what we are doing here, but um, again, if you're looking to the um, situation itself, uh, what, what we are proposing, this, I would say, is really nothing new. We are already living in a world like what we are proposing, but we are giving more clarity to it. And that's why then we are waiting. We probably then have to discuss these again in the, um, in the parliament. And uh, at the end, there will be the trialogue, as always, between council, commission and the parliament. And let's hope that we will might have at the end of 2022, a kind of a yeah, legislative product that everyone makes or feel happy about. Um, I know we, we have sometimes the, uh, the sense of over-regulating, but um, I, I know and, and I try to achieve here not to come to such a situation because we have just to stick to these legal operations and saying linking the one and making this clear. Of course, this means also we need expertise in saying what is an AI high risk system. And here, of course, um, we are asking again the commission um, to come up with a kind of a definition with a list and so on. And uh, that's why I think we might have at the end a good product where everyone can live with it. And, um, and, and also it's not a kind of a tool to uh, burdening the whole uh, AI industry and not give them a reason to leave Europe. Thank you so much. I mean, as advocates for top quality regulation practices, uh, certainly at SER, we will very much hope that the negotiations produce a good uh, product, as you put it at the end. Um, and, and we're very pleased to hear that uh, your feedback on the, the report, we will be following Ada's work in the, the coming months with great interest, the hearings and workshops you organize with a range of stakeholders. We very much look forward to your final report. Thank you again for joining us um, and, and for providing your feedback um, and, and please stay in touch. Many thanks. Yes, thank you and all the best. Have good talks. Bye. Bye. So very grateful for Mr. Voss's time earlier this week, and there are certainly many things worth exploring further um, within the remarks uh, Mr. Voss provided. So firstly, perhaps the view that he expressed about favoring an approach to upcoming proposals that merely um, harmonizes existing rules um, rather than introducing stricter rules. And secondly, his emphasis on openness to input on the criteria of AI in particular. And openness to input is a fantastic note on which to open the panel, which we're going to do now. Just a reminder that as well as the Slido poll running with the questions I announced earlier, you can also submit questions to speakers, details on the screen. Please let us know who you are if you can and whether you're addressing a particular panelist. So now indeed, to introduce our panelists for their input, which should give us good variety and indeed uh, debate. So we welcome, first of all, Dirk Staudenmeier, Head of Unit for Contract Law at DG Justice. Dirk, welcome, thanks for being here today. Also, Daniel Schoenberger, Head of Legal for Google, for Switzerland and Austria. Hello. Um, Matt Allison, Senior Public Policy Manager for Vodafone Group. Hello, and thanks to you two for being here. And lastly, Alexandre Biard, Senior Legal Officer for Bayuk, which represents consumers on the European stage. We will come to some focus liability questions in the uh, time we have, but let's start first with our speakers' reactions to the SER paper. Matt, I'm going to come to you first, if that's all right. Vodafone Group has had an AI framework in place for some time, and this framework sets out your understood definitions for AI, as well as your criteria for risk, which MEP Voss stressed the importance of in his interview. Thanks very much for your involvement and input throughout this report producing process. What do you think of the final result? 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Lara, for the opportunity to, to speak today um, uh, and say thank you for the academics for the hard work that's gone into this report. It's a really detailed, comprehensive and substantive contribution to the discussion. Um, and it comes along at just the right time. So we're, we're all anticipating um, what the Commission are going to come forward with the uh, AI proposal um, next month. And of course, discussions around um, the review of the product liability framework that will rumble on for the rest of this year. So very timely, very comprehensive. Um, I, I, I was going to give a kind of overview of, of Vodafone's uh, sort of views on AI liability, but actually it would be quite repetitive um, because much of it has been um, sort of mentioned already. Uh, so I'll probably just dive straight, straight in with some reactions to the report itself. Um, maybe just three things that I'd like to reinforce, three things that I've heard so far in the discussion that I'd like to reinforce as being important for Vodafone. Um, the, the first is to uh, agree with the comments that have been made that the existing um, both EU horizontal and sector specific uh, legislative framework uh, governing liability has proven to be very robust and very adaptable. Um, however, the limits are now being tested by some of AI's unique attributes. I think uh, Mr. Voss mentioned some of those around autonomy, opacity, complexity. Um, so it is our view that updates to the framework could be considered at this point. Um, and the SERI study is a really great contribution to that debate alongside, of course, the uh, European Parliament resolution authored by Mr. Voss, the uh, commission appointed expert group um, uh, so very happy to be part of this discussion at the moment. Um, the second point um, is that we definitely agree that there should be some level of risk-based assessment that goes into understanding what uh, liability requirements should apply to the different actors in a given AI supply chain. So, and that could mean that actually certain obligations are reserved only for high-risk AI applications. Um, and the final point is around balancing incentives, which I think is um, relevant not only for liability in the context of AI, but actually discussions around liability more broadly. Um, you know, we see this, for example, in the content regulation space. Um, the liability rules that, that operate after the fact, ex post, need to carefully balance incentives between the different actors, um, ensure that there is space for, for, for firms to innovate, but also that the end users of those products are, are protected and can have access and recourse to justice and, and compensation if and when things go wrong. Um, so with those kind of high level views outlined, um, a few reactions to the specific recommendations that we've seen in the report. Um, we kind of split these into two. So, you know, one set of things that we find really positive that we endorse, um, and then a second set uh, that, that potentially, uh, you know, kind of uh, would benefit from further investigation and questions. Um, to begin with on the positive side, the, the shift from operator to producer liability is, is a notion that we find a lot of value in actually. And we, we endorse the key finding within the report that developments in AI sophistication and autonomy tend to shift control of an AI system um, and therefore also responsibility and liability for when things go wrong away from the operator and towards the producers. And that this increases with the complexity and indeed the autonomy of the AI system itself. Uh, the second point that we agree with um, is the need to update and revisit certain key legal concepts and definitions that we have, um, particularly within the product liability directive. Um, and we'd certainly have some sympathy with the notion that we need to potentially broaden out the concept of product to include AI enabled software and intangibles um, in order for, for that framework to be future proof and, and fit for purpose. Um, and in addition, we also have sympathy with the notion that we need to revisit what constitutes a defect in the context of an AI um, system, given the fact that the, um, of course, the, yeah, the product or service can evolve and develop after it's been put on the market um, and could have some kind of dynamic capacity to, to self-learn and evolve over time. Um, and the final point, and I'll close on this actually and save some of the other comments that I have for the follow-up Q&A, is around enhanced transparency and information disclosure, um, which we think is a really important point in this conversation. Um, and we strongly endorse the need for transparency um, and information disclosure throughout AI supply chains to address uh, what are commonly called information asymmetries um, and crack open, again, a, a term that you hear a lot in these kind of debates, the, the kind of 
algorithmic black box. Um, so where possible, if we can put in place more information disclosure and more transparency, we think we can develop a much better understanding of the roles and responsibilities that exist across the AI supply chain and use that to fairly attribute liability obligations. And uh, I'll, I'll pause there and yeah, look forward to the, the follow-up Q&A. Thank you, Matt. Um, and, and thank you too for the balance and structure in your remarks. You mentioned balanced incentives, which I think regardless of perspectives people take, uh, and certainly Axel Voss alluded to it as well, is, is, is definitely a refrain in this conversation. And I expect it will come up more as, as the conversation progresses over the next 50 minutes. Um, Alexandre, let's come to you. Uh, Bayuk has I think a, a very impressive array of contributions to showcase to the to the AI debates, um, and you've written plenty on product liability uh, and Bayuk's views on the needs uh, for update to the framework, which understandably is a central question in your mandate to serve consumers. So, how have you received the AI report? And, and thank you again for your reflections and input as we put it together. Well, many thanks for your invitation. First of all. Uh, let me first congratulate the research team for this uh, very impressive and very rich uh, report on such a complex topic. Um, the report is, of course, very timely because it provides important insights, which I'm sure will be very useful for EU policymakers in the months to come. Uh, the report is also very timely, not only for EU uh, policymakers, but also for consumers. In last uh, October at Burke, we published a multi-country survey um, to assess consumer expectations vis-a-vis -vis AI and AI systems. And from the response that we collected, it was very clear that, okay, the majority of respondents took the view that it can be dangerous can, can, because it can fail. Uh, but the most important part here is that in situations where AI system cause harm, it is often not clear who the liable person is. And if you are interested, you can find this survey on our website. This being said, uh, our position at, at Berg is that many of the issues raised by AI could be solved via a revision of the product liability directive. The report clearly stressed the need to take the PLD on several aspects, uh, the notion of product to include the digital content software, the necessity to revise the burden of proof and so on. I agree with all these points, of course. I would just say that here that it's not the only points that should be uh, updated in LD. For example, we should have a discussion the, on the type of compensable harm, uh, you know, to cover also him. But in any case, I like the approach that is followed in the in the report, which is to say, let's first consider the challenges posed by AI, which could be addressed by an updated PLD, and then based on this, let's see if another instrument. I think really it's the right approach, um, just seeing how we can improve things with the instrument that we have today, instead of starting something completely new, with the risk of adding another layer of complexity and, uh, and, and another you know, problem with consistency. I will come back to that in a minute. If, ultimately, it turns out that we really need another instrument, then fine, but uh, still the starting point should be really let's see how we can maximize the, the PLD to solve the problems associated with AI. So there are so many points in the report that I would like to raise and discuss this afternoon, but because again, it's very rich and detailed and congratulations for this. I think that some, uh, some issues could have been further developed. For, ex for example, the issue of compensable damage, uh, in particular uh, compensation for immaterial damage, because you, you know it's very important when it comes to AI. Um, I think, well, this could require another discussion, maybe another report if you have time. Uh, I only have a few minutes, so I will focus on two points. Uh, the first one is uh, the, the notion of operator. And, this, so, and the second is the risk, uh, um, building a risk regime based on the, on the liability rules based on the risk profile of, of AI system. So on the notion of operator. The report um, reaches the conclusion that the specific liability regime uh, should be introduced for operators of AI system, and they are uh, defined as those who exercise control over the use of AI uh, system. I have several comments slash uh, concerns here uh, regarding this notion of operator. My first point is whether uh, instead of creating a new category around the notion of operator, this could not be solved directly in the PLD via an extended notion of producer. As you know, the PLD uh, builds on a wide definition of, of producer, which 
for example, includes, and you will say it very clearly in the report, it includes importer, but also producer of a component part. Um, I don't see reasons why operator could not fall also within an extended definition of producer under the PLD. My second point is, okay, let's admit that we need to keep the notion of operator. We want to introduce this notion of operator. Um, I see problems with its definition and scope. Uh, it is very, uh, as it is defined now, it is very broad. Uh, the operator might be the final user uh, because there are also persons who, who to some, some extent at least, can exercise control over on how the AI system is, is used. So in other words, uh, the operator can be the consumer, the final uh, end user. I think you will agree with me that there are huge differences between the company developing AI uh, systems, feeding the system with data, and a consumer using his or her uh, washing machine, a uh, uh, smart washing machine. Uh, the, the EP resolution of last autumn and made a difference uh, between back-end and front-end operator, which I don't think is very useful. Still, I think it should be crystal clear that the consumer cannot be considered as the operator. My third point is that let's now imagine that we continue with a double track for liability rules, meaning a revised PLD plus a new instrument. Uh, for uh, So lay, uh, laying down some rules for operator. Here, the key issue regards the interplay between um, the two legislations. And this is an aspect where the report, at least, I think, which could a bit uh, further uh, develop, could, could elaborate a bit further uh, on the practical consequences. It's very important if we intend to build a clear and workable liability framework. I think at some point, uh, we need to look at how li liability rules and liability regimes will interact and play in practice. I think it's a very important uh, practical exercise that we need to, 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 to do. To sum up quickly on this part, we should be careful um, when we assess the need, whether we need another category, a new category of operator, because this means adding another layer of, of complexity. From a consumer point of view, and I, I insist on this because it's very important, this distinction between producer and operator may not be that useful. Uh, worst, it could lead to some confusion. For example, consumer may not know to whom they should turn to in case of harm, or it may give uh, um, it may it may it may it may give rise to situation of ping pong, you know, between uh, professionals saying, "Oh, I'm not uh, liable; it is the, the the producer." Oh no, it's the operator. So this is something we should avoid at, at all costs. Um, for these reasons, at Berkeley, we will be re rather in favor of a solution where all professionals involved in the supply chain of AI system are jointly and severely liable when things go wrong, consumers should be able to direct their claim to one professionals, and then professionals can apportion or, or decide on their liability uh, through contractual arrangements on their side. This, would, this proposition actually would make sense, considering that actually the report itself uh, stressed this point and said that many uh, producers are operator. So there is no need to create a, like, a, a very uh, um, unclear category of operator, uh, and, and in, in particular when all the, the, the roles of operator and the producer are, are very interlinked and, and that there is no clear delimitation. Very quickly, my second point, regards the, the, the possibility to have different liability rules based on the risk profile of AI system. Um, we have concerns and some doubts with this approach. Um, first, and as a general remark, the vast majority of AI powered products today, at least in the coming years, um, they will be low risk products. Uh, so from a consumer perspective, the real concerns uh, co regards the harm caused by low risk AI products. Um, yet for the harm caused by this product, it's very difficult for consumers to bring a claim because of the, 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 the points that you raised in the report, the box effects, the complexity, the autonomy, and so on. So my point here is that, of course, it's important to discuss and reflect on high-risk AI products, but let's not, we should not forget that the bulk of consumer products will be low-risk AI products. My second point is that from a consumer perspective, the risk classification of product does not really matter uh, when it comes to compensation. Uh, what consumer cares about is a swift and fair compensation. And third, liability rules um, about is a swift and fair compensation. And third, liability rules um, based on the risk profile of AI system will bring another complexity. So to, to sum up, 
we should be careful before developing another separate instrument. Second, uh, many issues associated with AI can be solved via an updated PLD. It, and finally, it's important to be ambitious when it comes to the revision of the PLD. And the very last word, I often hear that we should be very careful and we should make sure that the revision of the PLD will not impair innovation. And I agree, it's important. It, it should be uh, carefully assessed. But at this stage, we should not be limiting ourselves and limit our uh, efforts or discussions. And actually, we should not also be um, uh, limited by ungrounded fears. Remember that back in the 1980s, many observers were uh, warned against you know, the huge increase in insurance premium, lower innovations, a uh, flood of product liability case. None of this happened. Uh, none of this materialized at the end of the day. So to conclude, let's be ambitious uh, and let's try to find a liability framework uh, for AI, which can be uh, workable for everybody, and, but which can also deliver for consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandre. Um, and uh, there are many themes there that have picked up on, on previous interventions, very much noted your point on clarity and, of course, on the need to work uh, concretely on definitions. Right. Um, Daniel, hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Google, of course, has been a leading voice in the AI debate and your, your head of legal mandate, I have to say, for both an EU member state in Austria and a, a country very much on European soil, if with at least some of its own regimes, uh, must give rise to some fascinating current and forward-looking questions when it comes to, to the liability regimes we're talking about on AI. Um, so thanks indeed for your input. And what are your main reactions to what Sarah is publishing today? So thanks so much, Laura, for, for having me. And before I start, I would, of course, also like to express my thanks and congratulations to uh, Miriam, uh, Alex, and, and Martin for all their super hard work and diligence that they put in what has become a really impressive um, work result here. It was a very interesting journey. I, I need to say accompanying this project a, a little bit. Uh, personally, I, I learned a lot. I hope that the uh, uh, experience here was, was mutually uh, pleasant. And no doubt that this uh, report will be an important piece uh, shaping the discussion uh, around AI li liability going forward in the, the next few months. Now, Google is a proclaimed AI first company and it cannot come as a surprise um, that we are very much excited about the promises of AI and the benefits it will bring to society at large. Um, for example, and, and just to, to name this one, last year, our uh, research teams, they issued um, a study in Nature that showed how a model for breast cancer screening actually surpassed human experts while also reducing the, the workload um, by as much as 88%. Now, however, um, and this is, of course, the, the reason why we're all here uh, today, uh, in other cases, the benefits might not be as straightforward. In that example, uh, no technology is 100% safe. And uh, there's, of course, always um, the possibility of abuse by nefarious uh, actors. So companies like ours, they cannot just build a promising new piece of technology without also taking the responsibility for how it is, um, it is used. That's why already in 2018, Google published our own AI principles um, to help guide ethical development and uh, use of our technology. But also beyond this um, individual company efforts, Sundar Pichai, our CEO, made actually very clear that AI needs to be regulated just to, to boost the public trust in its uptake. Um, the 1 million euro question now is, of course, um, how best to approach this. Now, the, the SARE report deals with liability questions. However, and, and we've heard that from, uh, from Miriam uh, today already, acknowledging also that addressing these questions, um, also the broader regulatory framework for AI uh, should be acknowledged. And this, of course, includes the ethical guidelines, the safety standards, sector-specific regulation, and in particular, the uh, horizontal AI regulation the Commission is working on that we're all um, waiting for, but also contract law is a, an interesting and, and um, important piece uh, in, in that whole puzzle. 
Now, this whole package must make sure that the distribution of, of risks and benefits uh, between producers, operators, users, and also then the concerned uh, third parties, that this is fair and that harmed entities receive compensation while still allowing um, companies uh, to innovate in uh, the space. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces in this picture at the moment still, and it's therefore difficult to make kind of spot on recommendations on ex post enforcement as the liability rules are, as long as um, the ex ante rules are, are still unknown. For example, it might well be that the perceived issues around the ability of a harmed person to prove negligence or a defect or then also causation or causality, that these issues will be solved with a set of upcoming rules on transparency and explainability. That said, um, the report is, as we think, doing a really great job in summarizing the existing framework and also describing uh, the various uh, incentives and trade-offs uh, for different options. And at large, we agree with uh, these findings. Uh, we also share the author's rather skeptical view, at least as we understand it, as far as the need uh, of a new horizontal liability uh, framework is concerned. And we agree that a sectoral approach would uh, probably be preferable. Um, on a more general note, uh, we think that the existing technology neutral liability framework, that this one is effective and, and still flexible enough to uh, cover the challenges that AI might uh, create. And changing these uh, foundational legal and societal frameworks should only be done in response to significant and uh, demonstrable uh, shortcomings. Um, however, to date, we think that such uh, evidence is still missing. This is also true for the three use cases that are discussed in the report. Uh, these cases, in our opinion, do not present any issues that could not be solved by existing laws and jurisprudence. And certainly they do not require sweeping uh, changes and the departure from long established uh, principles. In particular, we would caution against such uh, changes to the product liability directive as, as they were suggested today. Um, while a lot of the ongoing work is indeed not specific to AI at all, but relates uh, rather to software and services much more broadly, uh, we would find a non-discriminate extension to software and services, as well as uh, changes to the notions of defect and the concept of putting a product into circulation, uh, particularly concerning um, doing so could easily destroy the current well-functioning balance that is struck between uh, business innovation and uh, consumer protection. And all this could prevent useful uh, products reaching the market that would significantly uh, improve the safety of operations compared to the status quo. Or in other words, um, the opportunity costs of not using AI should be given the necessary attention. I think I leave it with this at this point. I will be very happy to go into further details in the uh, coming discussions, of course. Thank you very much for your feedback, Daniel. Um, and you mentioned what an important part of producing Dirk Staudemeyer. Dirk, thank you. So part of the piece contract law is uh, within this debate. And I, I can't think of a better segue for introducing Dirk Staudemeyer. Dirk, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to represent the Commission on this panel, and also for your extremely thoughtful inputs and questions that you've put to us at SARE in the last few months, uh, which will most definitely um, have improved the final study, we think. And we understand, of course, that the Commission is in deep reflection or, or even action mode, and, and that it's a big year for your unit and your team. So on that basis, what are your remarks on our report? Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Sarah uh, for the invitation, first of all, and thanks a lot to the academics for this thought-provoking report. I also, like uh, some of my predecessors, so I would like to um, make a few general remarks and then say a few words more specifically about the report itself. Now, first of all, um, the general remarks. Uh, the Commission for the moment, and it was already said, has already has only confirmed that it will follow the EP resolution on AI liability with legislation. It has not yet decided its approach. And at the moment, we are undertaking impact assessment work. 
And um, Mr. Foss said it already, we are, we are favoring a coherent approach to all questions related to liability. Therefore, we will launch coordinated public consultation and impact assessment work, both on harmonizing national liability laws for AI and on the revision of the product liability directive. Another general point is that the report stresses repeatedly what it calls a technology neutral approach. And this means that victims of AI should not be less protected than victims of traditional products and services. We very much agree with that. This is also a major aim for the commission. But moreover, the commission wants also to achieve two other objectives. First of all, we want to make sure, and also that has been mentioned several times, that victims of AI systems are provided with adequate compensation. And second, we want to roll out, uh, promote the rollout of AI. Victim compensation influences trust, and trust is what we need for the uptake of AI. And for promoting the rollout of AI, we should achieve legal certainty and avoid fragmentation of the market. Mr. Foss mentioned that already through diverging national approaches. And it means that these two benchmarks, are, these two objectives are for us the benchmarks of designing any possible future initiative. Now a few more specific comments on the report itself. First of all, the report confirms that uh, AI specific challenges of opacity and autonomy for the application of liability rules. Indeed, these specifics make it difficult for a victim to prove fault and causality and therefore make a successful compensation plan. So we agree something needs to be done in order to adapt liability rules to these specific challenges of AI. But we need to do it, that's a bizarre approach, in a targeted and risk-based way. So that means intervening only where it is necessary and only so far as it is necessary. And that brings me to my next point. Because the report notes also that not all AI systems have these AI specific challenges. Yes, we agree. Uh, this would speak for a targeted approach focusing on those AI systems with opacity on autonomy. It is those AI systems which are challenging the application of uh, uh, liability rules. And then the report underlines also the diversity of national liability rules. Indeed, they are diverse. All national laws have fault-based liability. It's sort of the, the common denominator for all, but they have very different strict liability schemes. Some are very horizontal, like in France, for instance. Some are less horizontal. They're linked to dangerous things or similar approaches. And some are applying only to very specific technologies. What the report unfortunately does not so much is looking at legal certainty and avoiding fragmentation through these different national approaches. Concretely, what would that mean? Can existing fault-based liability rules apply to AI-specific challenges of opacity and autonomy? Or more importantly, for strict liability, is an AI system as such a dangerous thing? and therefore there would be strict liability. Or are some AI systems dangerous and some are not? Depending on the answers in the member states, we would have different solutions and therefore legal certainty. But we would also have fragmentation. If some member states do not adapt their laws and others do, but they do it differently. In any event, then the overall situation would be a patchwork. So if that is the result, how can businesses distributing AI-equipped products and services cross-border determine their liability risks and ensure themselves against them? A couple of um, personal comments which I wanted also to add for the sectorial liability approach which the report uh, puts forward. So the idea to reflect existing product safety rules, that's an interesting idea. Let's have a closer look and I throw up some, just some questions which came to my mind when I was reading the report. First of all, looking at the EU product safety rules, we have different levels. We have a general level for all products. That's the uh, General Product Safety Directive, which applies to all products which are not specifically harmonized. And then we have specific rules. And in these specific rules, we have two groups. 
ones where the, the directives harmonize the requirements and others where the so-called new approach, where the requirements are left to standardization. So what I'm not clear about is what this means, the sectorial approach reflecting product safety. Is it for all which is covered by the GPSD or is it only for those who have specific requirements? And if it's only for those, is it for those which are harmonized or those which are left for, <coughs> I apologize, um, which are left for uh, standardization? And that is obviously <clears throat> an interesting question. Or is it all of this together? Um, and that uh, would be very interesting to know, but perhaps we come in the discussion to that. But if we link it to safety rules, what about services? There are no safety rules for services. Does that mean that AI services will not be covered with liability rules? And then a last comment. Let's look at political feasibility of such a sectorial approach. Think for a moment, you're working in a national ministry of justice. So you have your national approach, which is fault-based liability for everything. And then you have a, according to the member state, a different approach as to strict liability, either horizontal, totally broad, or relatively broad, or very specific. And then the EU tells you to interfere, that we will interfere in the system with different liability rules according to different product categories. Would you support that? I don't know. So my conclusion for the moment is we are not there yet. This is an important step in the reflection process. We need to continue to reflect and we need to consult more specifically on liability related questions. And we need to have our objectives in mind. We want to promote the role out of AI and we need trust. And first and foremost, for trust, we need safety. That's another point which is highlighted by the report. And we couldn't agree more, but there will be accidents still. And then victims, as the report rightly points out, should not, of AI should not be less protected than victims of traditional products. That's what we have to aim for. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to you. Um, Thank you for the positive feedback and also like with, with all speakers so far, there have been remarks on what we could also have included in the in the report, which is already a, a, a chunky piece of work. So I, I think it's really a sign of, of the breadth of considerations uh, we, we need to take full account of when looking at AI liability and, and Sarah will certainly keep talking about this. I think um, time is flying very, very fast. Um, it, however, it would be a shame not to delve into some more specific aspects that go beyond uh, general views on the report. We also have a lot of questions coming in from viewers, and I think a couple of them uh, might be captured by this next question, which I'd be very interested in the speaker's views on. So one of it, it's really about one of the key recommendations coming out of the reports, which is that with the increased sophistication of AI products, the responsibility for when things go wrong shift as a tendency from the operator or the deployer to the producer. Should liability be on the producer or the operator when we argue for the latter? How do you determine the operator? Um, I know Bayer's comments maybe went into a bit more detail on this already. Um, maybe, maybe Dirk, how, how about we, we think about any further comments on that you might have to segue into our next speakers? Mute. Sorry, I, I was I had a little bit of connection problems. I did not hear your last question. I apologize. Could you repeat that, please? That's okay. Um, so if, if we look for liability to be on the operator, how would you determine who an operator is? Okay. Um, well, first of all, if we look for liability on the operator, I mean, we have to see what scheme we apply. Are we talking about fault-based liability or are we talking about a producer, a product, a producer liability? Um, for, for producer, it's clear it's only the producer. Um, for fault-based liability, it could be the producer and the operator, depending on who did something wrong. For strict liability in member states, it's mostly the operator. 
So first of all, for, for fault-based liability, you don't have to define who the operator is because the, the debtor of a compensation claim under fault-based liability is somebody who has done something wrong. And that could be, as I said, the producer or the operator, depending on who did something wrong. So if the producer did something wrong, the producer can be sued. If the operator did something wrong, the operator can be sued. And if both did something wrong, both can be sued under fault-based liability. So no need to define operator. The need to define operator only comes in if the operator is the uh, responsible person under a strict liability scheme. Now that's a big if, of course, but the re reality is that uh, member states in almost all their strict liability schemes have always chosen the operator as the reliable person. And the reason for this is mainly, I mainly two, and they're also mentioned in the report. So the first and most important reason is the operator draws the benefit from using a certain technology and then exposes the public at large to a risk. And that's why it is the operator who should uh, pay the compensation. And the second is that it provides an incentive for the operator to select where the system is used and ensure that it is used properly. Now, coming from that, um, the question is who, how to define the operator having these two objectives for the operator's liability in mind. And then I think a very interesting uh, point, which is mentioned, the, the control criteria is uh, an interesting point. It may be that one needs to combine this with something Mr. Foss said, because the, a control criteria is an is a abstract legal term. It may be useful for purposes of legal certainty to combine this with a list. But as I said, that would be only for those cases where an operator is defined as the liable person under a possible strict liability scheme and not for fault-based liability. Uh, that question is not relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Alexandre Destrel wants to react quickly on this. Alex, can I bring you in now? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, to everyone for, um, for your comment on, on the report. So there is still work to do. <laughs> Uh, but that's the, I mean, that's the aim at CERN because we want to have uh, a line of research. We have a line of research on AI, so clearly uh, more work will be done. I just want to react on the on the point uh, that Dirk made, uh, which I think is very, very relevant. Um, and uh, whether when we link to, to safety, what kind of safety rule and, and what is the political acceptability of that? Now, um, and, and I will uh, leave my colleague also to react on that, but our, our view, I think, is that um, it should be linked to the sectoral. A liability rule, uh, because that's where a uh, safety rule, safety rule, sorry, because that's probably where, um, and this is why we have those sectoral safety rule, they have a high risk, okay? And so it would make sense then uh, to have also a stricter uh, liability rule there as well. Um, and also because, at his, as it has been mentioned by Daniel also, uh, there is of course a um, close link between safety rule and, and liability rule. So I think our idea was really uh, to, um, to the sectoral one. Now, is that acceptable um, to the member states? I mean, you are a better judge than us on that, but my, my take would be that um, maybe they would prefer that than an overall system of the liability regime generally because of AI. And I think one of our starting point of the report is to say, as Dirk, you were saying, I mean, technological neutrality, we have a balance which is done today in the liability regime between uh, harmonization and what is left to member states and between the interest of um, the user and the producer or the victim and, and the, the, the one who did the fault. So we have a balance which is there and we don't think that this balance should be upset by AI. Okay, we, our, our idea is that uh, we have a kind of um, we have a kind of uh, balance there. Um, yes, user needs to be uh, protect as as much as with a non AI product, but the balance should not necessarily be completely disrupted because of AI, and therefore um, AI should not be the occasion to harmonize all the liability regime of the member states. I think that is one of the um, points that we want to make in the report. 
you, Alex. Thank you very much for clarifying. And, and as you say, we hope to continue researching on AI. So, so watch this space, everyone. Um, Daniel, can I come to you now for your view on, on the question that Dirk commented on uh, before, more, more specifically on, on liability being on the producer or the operator? If you argue for the operator, how do you determine who an operator is? I think ultimately we should not lose out of sight what we're actually trying to, to achieve here. And, and I have very often um, the impression, we are discussing a little bit of a hypothetical, very far away AI future, where like totally autonomous robot searchers uh, are, are working on, on patients, where we have taxi drones flying around totally uh, autonomously, et cetera. That, that's not the, the reality and will not be for, for a very, very long time. So what we have today is, is actually not so much or almost no tools that, that replace human decision-making or, or human interaction or oversight. Um, our reality is, is much more within the realm that, that I spoke at the very beginning that we have like these, these um, models for, for breast cancer screening, where um, you have a, a support tool that, that uh, enables um, doctors to make faster and more informed uh, information, but ultimately the healthcare professional will stay in, in charge here. So that, that's kind of the, the reality we are, we are dealing with. And then um, I think, the question producer um, uh, uh, or, or operator, uh, it's, it's relatively easy at the, at the moment also because the current framework, there knows a shared responsibility between all the, the different actors in, in the field and a harmed person will often have many different claims, for example, under the PLD, uh, under, under negligence or, or tort, uh, concepts um, against the holder or owner uh, of a car, for example, or uh, directly against uh, an insurance. So very much will actually depend on the very specific application we're talking about, and also on the and the con uh, on the context. And and we also heard this before. Uh, current um, rules and, and and courts in the member states they always found a way. Um, to accommodate new technologies and find ways to, to alleviate the, the burden of proof, for example. I do not see any need to depart from, from this at the moment. Um, what seems clear, however, is that uh, to the extent that a product is market as, uh, marketed as, as fully autonomous, um, there will not be very much space for a negligence claim uh, against the, the owner or, or the operator here. Uh, however, these will remain very rare instances that probably have a very high societal value. So we might want to think about possible insurance solutions um, with buy-in, of course, from, from the insurance uh, industry, which, which is not present here. And I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on these questions. But it seems clear to me that shifting all the risks to the producer could have the, the unwanted effect that the products will ultimately not be marketed as, as fully autonomous, uh, even though continuing human oversight would actually uh, increase the risk here. Uh, so why would you commit someone, a driver, to have their hands always on the steering wheel and intervene if, if the, the, the self-driving mode is actually a lot safer? So this could have this paradoxical situation that you actually hamper um, uh, the, the innovation in that space, making things uh, a lot safer. And this would definitely be a, a missed opportunity, which uh, should be avoided. Thank you so much, Daniel. Time is really flying. I know Carol San Martin Pites wants to come in. Yeah, I guess uh, I would like to, to add essentially in the, in the same direction. I think the initial statement was that often it's clear who is at fault? And, and this is not necessarily the case. Actually, it all depends on the expectations. If I'm the operator and I expect certain things are taken care of and considered by AI, uh, then, well, at least I don't think that I was at fault, that I didn't pay attention to certain things, whereas perhaps I should. So there is a communication, possibly a communication problem between uh, AI and the humans who are 
to a certain extent in charge. And therefore we should see that the, the way uh, compensation uh, claims against operator or producer are made has an effect on the incentives, uh, first of all, to, to innovate, but also in times, terms of what kind of innovation it will be. So to whether we go, whether one goes to rather um, strong, uh, full, um, whether the, the decision still will be mostly delegated to the operator or not. And therefore I think this is something which actually is um, not, will not be fully be decided uh, by the commission, whoever does it, because this in the end will be interpreted by the laws and there will be some dynamics in there. As AI can adapt better to understand also the imperfect decision-making by operators, um, some problems can be um, reduced over time. And I guess these kind of these dynamics uh, shouldn't be overlooked. Thank you, Martin. Thank you indeed. Um, moving swiftly on, uh, Alexandre, perhaps we could, uh, if you have anything to add from your opening remarks on the producer operator liability question. Yeah, and maybe I can also react to three, three comments that were made. Um, the first one, um, regarding what you said, Martin, on the very often we will know who is at fault. From a consumer perspective, I don't think so. Very often, the 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 harmed person, the inj the injured person, will not know uh, who is at fault. So this is the reason why you need to have a clear go-to point um, uh, to which the consumer can turn to in case of if there is a problem with someone where they could direct their claim to. So um, this is something I assume a producer, or the, the operator could you, could know who is at fault, but the consumer will not know, no, not not know this. First point. The second point is regarding the operator. I will not uh, further develop because I already um, uh, mentioned this in, in my talk, but um, again, this shows that we should not be swamped into uh, this discussion on who is the operator, who is the producer. That's why we should have a, an extended uh, definition of producer covering uh, the operator. I think it's a very important step uh, to make. And the third point, and here I also disagree with um, with Daniel um, regarding the, the we, there is no need to introduce big changes in the liability rules and the PLD. Um, here I disagree, for example, with regarding the standard of proof. Um, we may need to revise the standard of proof, even reverse uh, the standard of proof. Uh, it's a matter of fairness, because who has the information today? Uh, the, the the professional, not the consumer. Some, somewhere in the report you say that uh, consumers may have information, the recording information, Informations, or you know, the, the, to, 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 for registering information, or I don't know how you phrase it, but okay, it's a, it's a, it's an issue to have the information, but it's another one to be able to use it, uh, to be able to use it to substantiate the claim. So uh, transparency, and that's very fine, but uh, this is not, I mean, this is not uh, enough, and I think here yeah, we should, need, we will need to revise the standard of, of, um, of, of proof. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre. Matt. Thanks, Lara. Um, fascinating discussion. Just, just a reflection, actually. This, this really mirrors um, a discussion that I've heard within the, the industry, the telecommunications industry, um, in relation to um, definitions in the European Parliament and the expert groups report around front-end and back-end operators. Um, and I think what's clear, actually, what emerges is both in that discussion and the one that we're having today, we do tend to try and sort of force or sort of shoehorn in um, kind of AI use cases and applications into either of the, the, the definitions so that we can kind of categorize things and make it all make sense. And, and unfortunately, these are just very complex supply chains. So it is an imperfect science. Um, and I would just reiterate the point that I, that I closed on, um, which is that information disclosure and transparency will be key to actually understanding how we fairly allocate rights and responsibilities. Because I think as is clear from this discussion, we can obsess and spend a lot of time over, you know, trying to cleave out those differences between producers and operators or front end and back end operators, you know, and actually what matters is what does each party do and the more information and transparency we can have about that, the, the better and more fairly we'll be able to attribute, attribute liability. Um, I, I did have one, um, one, one question actually, or one kind of discussion point that I thought might be useful for any time that we had left, which is, um, I'm really interested by the, um, the recommendation in the report around the notion of defect and that we should move towards the notion of an overall failure rate rather than individual defects. 
um, which seems potentially a problematic concept from, from our perspective. And I do wonder if any of the authors could come back on that and explain what the, the motivation is, why they think that's justified, and if they have any concerns about you know, what that would do for the balance of incentives, which we mentioned is very careful. If you sort of break that chain of causality, would it not upset that balance of incentives in a way that could be potentially quite damaging? Thanks so much, Matt. And um, perhaps Miriam uh, can, can address that question in closing remarks, right? We have six minutes left. Time is absolutely flying. What I would really like to do now is announce the results of the Slido poll that we've run. So um, I think these are ready to show. Great. So on whether liability systems should be stricter, for liability rules, sorry, should be stricter for AI systems than for non-AI systems. 65% thought they should not be. 29% believe they should be, and 6% have no opinion. If we move on to the second question polled, do we need EU harmonization to protect against AI-specific risks, or should the adaptation of liability rules be left to member states' discretion? Uh, a large majority there believe that EU harmonization is needed, 76%. Um, the same figure had no opinion, and 18% believe we should leave it to member states. So some conclusion in that results, right. Uh, thank you very much for showing those results. We are coming to the end of this session. There were many more questions coming in from viewers and, and many more that, that I would have liked to ask, but um, this is clearly a topic that, that merits uh, revisiting. Um, what I would like to do now, speakers, it's, it's very short, but if there is a top line takeaway, like very literally 30 seconds or one line of what you've learned from today's discussion or, or what you'd like us to take away, um, that would be uh, great. Uh, Matt, maybe as I still see you on my screen, uh, you first. I mean, I think, you, I think you have mine already, so I'll say it a third time, which is enhanced transparency and information disclosure, but, but also to yeah. round the point off by saying what is really important and fundamental for us is a detailed and thorough mapping of the AI um, sort of value chain or supply chains to understand who does what, and that's really going to be crucial to getting this, um, getting this right as we, as we go ahead. Yeah, that's a great point on mapping indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Alexandre? Yeah, so thanks thanks again for the for the report and the discussion today, first of all. Um, my uh, conclusions will be, let's work first with the PLD, let's try to maximize the benefits brought by the PLD, then we can see if another instrument is needed. Uh, and uh, for the future discussions, I'm sure we will have many other discussions in the coming months. Um, uh, let's uh, keep broad views and we should not uh, restrict ourselves uh, through uh, with uh, ungrateful grounded fears. Uh, let's have open discussions uh, because there is a lot that can be done. Thank you. Great. Uh, and hopefully this has indeed been an open discussion. Daniel? And certainly, Charlotte, this, this is very complex and there are lots of different instruments uh, at, at many different levels interacting. So um, the approach that the Commission seems to be taking now to coordinate at, at different levels um, to come up really with a coherent uh, framework, looking at all different angles, ex uh, ante, ex post, that, that's, that's very much uh, appreciated. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. And Dirk? Thank you very much. Two sentences, basically. First one is we should make sure that victims are not left uncompensated. And the second thing is we definitely do not want that uh, innovation is slowed down. And there I wanted to pick up on something which Daniel said, the insurance dimension is key. Because with insurance, we can make sure that the costs of the economic burden of liability is basically the annual insurance premium or the difference between a pre-existing annual insurance contract. And that will help a lot because it will lower the market entry barriers and it will allow innovation to play. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we cannot wrap up the session without a last word from Miriam. Miriam, congratulations again, over to you. Thank you, Lara. Uh, so my main takeaway of today is that it's one thing to agree on principles for a liability regime for AI. And we've seen that we may have different views there uh, on how much liability should be carried by each party or how much harmonization AI justifies. We do, I think, all agree on balancing incentives, but then it's a whole other thing to actually 
turn that into a workable liability regime uh, with a clear scope and with clear definitions. And so it, it turns out time and time and again that that needs more work. Um, as to Matt's question, um, Indeed, the seeing defect as a failure rate overall has drawbacks as well. Maybe we don't want only one product in the market to be considered safe because it is the safest. So that is definitely one of the many issues on around definition and scope that needs more thoughts. And so I take all your points and I look forward to, uh, on working on that further. So thank you again. Thanks again to all viewers for your attention on what has been such a timely session and as always for the CERC team who work incredibly hard in putting these events together which we're running at quite a frequent rate at the moment. Thank you uh, primarily in this instance to Miriam, Martin and Alexandre for a report that we hope will be a central reference point as clearly liability rules for AI will be top of mind in the months and, and possibly years ahead. Um, Axel Voss reminded us indeed that the, the path ahead has many steps. Update on SER activities, events, studies, etc. are available via our free newsletter, which you can sign up to by the SER website, SER.eu. Next event is a deep dive into platform responsibilities in the media in the context of the DSA on Monday, the 29th of March. With that, thank you very much for your time. Until very soon, stay safe and well. Bye for now. <laughs>